Hello, I'm Nora O'Donnell, and this is Person to Person. Our guest today, Peloton's Robin Arson. Robin Arson inspires and motivates millions of Americans with her spin and running classes through Peloton, the at-home workout company. What's your hustle worth? This ultra-fit superstar wasn't always athletic. She didn't play sports growing up and was a top-notch lawyer before making fitness her full-time career. Now she's vice president of programming and head instructor at Peloton. But it doesn't stop there. Arson teaches a master class about mental strength. Fear is fuel. And is the author of two New York Times bestsellers, including her children's book, Strong Mama, dedicated to her one-year-old baby girl, Athena. And from New York City, she joins us for an intimate person-to-person -person conversation. Robin, so good to have you and so good to talk to you. Oh my gosh. Hi, Nora. It's so nice to see you. <laughs> oh my gosh. What a thrill. My friend Anne Marie, who I went to college with, we text back and forth when we're on the treadmill or the bike. And I always say to her, it's like going to church running with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're shoulder to shoulder with giants. I like it. Let's polish our crowns together. <laughs> I love that, how you talk about the crown that each of us wear. What, what, how did you come up with that saying, and how are you trying to inspire people with that? Well, I was raised by royalty. My mother is a queen. I was raised to be a proud Cuban and Puerto Rican Latina, and I believe that I polished my crown with sweat. And that's something that I developed when I laced up for my very first run, and I've carried it with me ever since. You know, since I've spent so much time with you on the tread, I know a lot of your history and background. And I was stunned when you said that you were allergic to exercise growing up. How could that be? <laughs> That's a great question. You know, I was, we become the stories that we tell ourselves. And I told myself the story that I wasn't an athlete. I was the straight A student. I was the arts and crafts kid. And it really, you know, was nerve wracking for me to, to go to gym class. And I didn't, I believe that we all have a superhero toolkit. And in my toolkit, I added running, movement, sweating, biking, picking up weights only as an adult. So um, I now want to pay it forward and I want you know, young folks to know that, that movement is medicine and that everyone should know that self-care is not selfish. I so believe that, that movement is medicine. And I feel like having been through this pandemic, all of us for the past couple years, we all need more good movement for good medicine to make us feel better. Yeah, and we crave connection, right? So it, if there's a way that we can feel good within our bodies, then we're more likely to reach out and be leaders in our communities and in our homes, which is really where folks need us. In one of your classes the other day, you said, change is possible if you want it badly enough. How does someone make that change possible? I do believe that we're fueled very much by purpose. If you make it matter, you will make it happen. And I love asking myself three questions. What is my why? Why not me? Meaning I can bet on myself. And what decision would I make if I were twice as confident and twice as strong? And in, in those three questions, we can answer through action and, and really start to make change. But it starts little by little. Little by little amounts to a lot, I tell myself, especially on long runs. <laughs> <laughs> do you think it's true only for women or do men struggle with the same thing? Realizing not only the power of our own voice, but the power of our own ability to change the direction of our lives. I think everyone struggles with that little voice. It, you know, we, we have the ability to turn our inner critic into an inner advocate. Everyone does. I do believe that our mind is our most crucial business tool, our, our biggest relationship tool, and really the conversation that we have in between our ears is the most important one we're gonna have every day. So can we speak to ourselves like we would a friend? Can we make it kind, make it powerful? And I do believe that every human you know, has the ability to step into the vastness of who they are, and a crucial piece of that is gonna be you know, our, our mindset. Mm -hmm. I mean, you changed your own story. You were a successful lawyer, and then you said, I want to do something else. Tell us about that journey. 
I call myself a reformed lawyer. <laughs> I was a corporate <laughs> litigator in New York City. Um, I, you know, I'm wearing a suit today, but I traded my suits for spandex <laughs> to teach at Peloton. Um, but yeah, we all have the capacity for change. We own the pen to the stories that we're writing. And I realized that I was leading a divorce existence, counting down the hours until I could run. And I thought, gosh, I want to make this my life. I, I, you know, our purpose requires no one's permission. And I decided I'm gonna, I'm gonna really stoke the fires to, for, to my own flame, and that involved f figuring out a way that I could create a career involving running movement and and creating a platform for folks to step into their own power through workouts. You know, I think many people feel like they know you really well, spending a lot of time sweating with you and being motivated and inspired by you. But one new thing that I learned about you in preparing for this interview was something that happened to you as a senior in college, that you were held at gunpoint. How did that change you? Mm -hmm. We all have inflection points, right? Um, hopefully they're not all tr traumatic. That was certainly a traumatic incident in my life. I mean, being held at gunpoint and essentially becoming you know, going out one evening with girlfriends and stepping into a wine bar in New York City and then walking out a hostage survivor. Uh, that's talking about a sliding doors moment. But um, every day when we wake up after something that has happened to us, we have a choice. We can be a victim or we can be victorious. And I chose to be the latter. I chose to be the hero in my own story. We do not need anyone's permission to be the heroes in our own stories. And, um, you know, as we develop, you know, our skill sets and our superhero toolkit, then we have different ways to access our agency, our power. And it was through a pair of running shoes where I really started to run through the pain. And ultimately, pain becomes power. Talk about that, because how did running help you become victorious? I was able to go from a feeling of powerlessness to powerful. And with every, and tr the runs were very hard. <laughs> I would say they're more like jog walks in the beginning, but you know, with every block, with every light, you know, I would just tell myself, just jog to the next mailbox. And it, that little by little, those nibbles of hustle, I call them, I was able to string together enough moments of confidence building through the discomfort, through the pain, that I realized I've survived 100% of my worst days and I'm still here, so try me. And, and now a mantra that I use a lot is turn why me into try me. Mm. It's like I'm going to just keep taking one step forward because I've been through worse. And so many of your mantras that you repeat throughout those runs, I think that's why you're so popular. It's not only a good workout, but I think you help people work through those, that inner critic that's in their head. Absolutely, and, and that is, I, I wanna be a fire starter. I want folks to take a workout. Yeah, sure, sometimes it's just a 20 or 30 minute run, but what if that is planting a seed? What if that is allowing you to befriend yourself? I think that is one of the most amazing things that happens when, when somebody turns can't into can, and oftentimes it is through the run, it's through the work, like that run kind of becomes a rite of passage. And then on the other side, you're meeting and congratulating a better version of yourself. I mean, that, that makes us all change agents. It basically makes us magicians. <laughs> mm -hmm. You take so many of what many people would call, you say, turn your doubts into determination. You say, make fear your fuel. They sound good, but a lot of people struggle with, how do you do it? How do you make that transformation? One small step. The finish line looks daunting, especially when we live in a social media age where it lo it, you're scrolling in your feed and you're like, did everyone run, run a marathon before I've even had my morning coffee? Like, it feels <laughs> like everyone's doing a lot. Um, so that comparison game is real, right? And sometimes that fear can be incredibly paralyzing. So um, I, I always say, just start with one. It's one step. It's one class. It's one I would say one mile, but I don't even think it's one mile, it's one block. I literally started with one block. Mm -hmm. And that one block, with enough commitment, consistency, determination, and passion, turned into marathons and ultra marathons. I like to use the work back approach. So begin with the end in mind. It's establish the finish line, where it's whether it's literal, figurative, or just 
I'm going to move my body three times this week. And then schedule it, plan it. You are the CEO of your body. You are the CEO of your life. Put it in your planner and then tell your loved ones about this new goal so they can support you. Uh, I do believe that you know we're wired for connection. We're wired for community. So whether it's on a platform like Peloton, you're finding somebody online, you're telling somebody you know at your local you know place of worship or somebody on your block. Um, I, I do believe that naming it and claiming it makes it more real. But then we have to do the work, and, it's, and it, it starts with that rule of one. When I was a lawyer, I had a 10 minute a day rule where I would schedule a calendar appointment for 10 minutes a day. And in those 10 minutes, that's when I started dreaming, plotting, and planning for this new life that I live now. Wait, so what did you do during those 10 minutes? Honestly, so I was working 80 hours a week as a lawyer. I felt like I had no time. And that's where I learned that replace I don't have time with it doesn't matter and see how that sits. Because we have an ability to claim our lives back. And I did it little by little. So I set a 10 minute calendar appointment before my morning meeting with the partners at my law firm. And in those 10 minutes, I would do a Google search, send an email, message a friend. I was you know, doing, people were kind enough to do like little informational interviews with me just so I could know like what they did for jobs, like editors at magazines and things. And it was in those 10 minutes that I started to cobble together a new life and dream. I think that was the most important thing that sometimes that I did in those 10 minutes was just journal, like, what do I want for my life? Mm. And I gave myself that space. It's such a good message because I suffer from the I do not have time syndrome. <laughs> But I do. The great thing, too. <laughs> but, but you're running with me, so you're making the time. <laughs> well, and also because you offer 20 and 30 minute classes. So I say, well, I don't have time. And I'm saying, well, you know what? I do have at least 20 minutes. And with you, you can get a pretty big sweat on in 20 minutes. So, so Robin, thank you. All right. When we come back, we'll talk to Robin about a diagnosis that shook her world. When we come back. And we are back with Robin Arson. Robin, so good to have you back. Um, let's talk about a diagnosis you received eight years ago. You were diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. How did that shake your world? I was, I mean, there's a before and then there's an after. You, it, when, when my doctor said, your, your pancreas doesn't produce insulin, it didn't compute. And the, you know, I was, doing marathons and ultra marathons. I was eating a very healthy diet. I was probably the healthiest person that I knew. And yet here, here we are. I live as with, with type one diabetes. My pancreas doesn't produce insulin and I'm insulin dependent. And the first question I asked my endocrinologist was, how am I gonna run the race I have in three weeks? I was just so determined to continue living my life unapologetically that um, it didn't slow me down. And did you run that ultra marathon? I sure did. <laughs> I sure did, Nora. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's truly unbelievable. And, and there are like a million and a half people that suffer with uh, type 1 diabetes. So the, you are such an inspiration to think that you can still do these races that many people in their lives never even get close to contemplating. Well, it all goes back to betting on ourselves. Right? I mean, when you ask yourself the question, why not me? And then you prepare, right? So I did my research, I, I, I worked with my medical team, and I continued to bet on myself. And that has paid dividends because I am in control of my story, and I'm not gonna limit it um, by somebody else's definition of success. I'm gonna be striving for my own. And for me, as an athlete, as a human, as a woman, as an entrepreneur, as a mother, it requires, you know, insulin in my superhero toolkit. But it doesn't mean I'm going to stop going for finish lines, real and figurative. Mm -hmm. This is, I think, at the heart of, of everyone's journey, which is how to take obstacles and use them to make one stronger and not be defeated by them. What is that voice you tell mm -hmm. yourself? <laughs> you know, the, the mental gymnastics, I think especially as endurance athletes, that's one of the reasons why I love ultra marathons is because you're out there on the road. I remember when I was running uh, to raise money, my mother lives with MS, and to raise money for MS research, I, did a, I participated in a point-to-point -point relay from LA to New York City. My leg was five marathons in five days across Utah. And 
I had a lot of time out there over the mountains of Utah to talk to myself. <laughs> and I started asking myself, like, if I played, you know, reflexively, I was asking Robin, if you played your thoughts on a loudspeaker, would you be proud of them? Would they be kind? And would they be powerful? Would you speak to yourself? Like, would you speak to a loved one the way you're speaking to yourself right now? And that's when I really start to unpack and distill and unlock um, that that is the most important conversation that we're going to have and that a lot of our power lies within that that internal conversation so mm -hmm. i would ask folks how are you speaking to yourself are you speaking to yourself like you would a loved one like you would your daughter your son your partner um your sister your brother because that that is truly you know the relationship with others starts with self you have to fix that first mm -hmm. and you have to nurture that self before you can do anything else. And it's really at the heart of um, a happy life, right? I mean, it really is. I, I do wanna ask you about your mother because you posted about your mom the other day and I follow you and I thought, okay, now I know where some of this comes from because your mom is incredible. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us Agreed. about her. Agreed. I co-signed. I co She's incredible. So she is a Cuban refugee. She taught herself English by watching PBS and Sesame Street. <laughs> um, she put herself through medical school. She's been practicing medicine for over 40 years. And I really saw in her an example of someone who is unapologetic. My mom told me when I was growing up, stay weird because nobody remembers normalcy. And she lived that, you know? She really is, she's like a walking exclamation point in the way she speaks and dresses and moves and dances. And I've always had her very intoxicating energy to really be a guiding light. And I'm very grateful to, um, I'm grateful that my soul chose hers to be my mom. Wow. And it sounds like she not only brought up such a strong uh, daughter in you and a woman, but she also fed your mind with a lot of positive thoughts and fed you with a sense of confidence to do whatever you want and to change in the middle after already becoming a lawyer to change and have a second incredibly successful career. You were receiving a lot of positive thoughts from your mom. How did that give you the confidence to do what you do today? It's everything. My, mo my mother is the kind of person who makes your own backbone a little straighter. And in being raised by her, I realized I want to be the kind of woman who fixes another queen's crown without telling her it was crooked in the first place. I want to be the kind of person who allows um, our spaces to be platforms for greatness, even when a plateau feels icky, sometimes it's a launching pad. And I also learned that from her, that not every season of life is gonna be amazing. Not every moment is gonna feel great. But we do have resiliency in our DNA. And um, she's, she gave me permission to be myself and trust my own instincts. So when I told her, this law thing isn't for me, even though, even though we poured money and time <laughs> and a whole lot into this first career, uh, she trusted me to change my mind. and that I've always, I've always been very grateful for that. Mm -hmm. That's why I say running with you is like going to church, Robin, learning all of this. <laughs> <laughs> all right, when we come back, we're gonna talk to Robin about her own journey with motherhood and her new book. And we're back with Robin to talk about her next career, being a mom. <laughs> That's another full-time job for you. How is motherhood? It sure is. <laughs> I love being a mom. I love being Athena's mom. She has brought so much joy and levity and buoyancy into our lives. And yeah, I wear it, many hats and mom is <laughs> the most important one for sure. <laughs> and will always be the most difficult one as a mom myself. Um, the name, Athena, I imagine that was deliberate, that name, to mean something, knowing a little bit about Greek mythology myself. Yeah, it was. You know, that's, it's something that we were, my husband and I love Greek mythology, and we were always drawn to Athena. And I love that, you know, she's, of course, it's goddess energy, and wisdom and war, right? That we can be a lot of things. We can both be both at peace and on fire. And 
she's going to define for herself, you know, how to step into her name. But she's certainly got a legacy <laughs> before her. <laughs> and your new children's book, Strong Mama. What was the message you wanted parents or grandparents or anybody reading to their children in that book? Caregivers should know that movement is medicine and self-care is not selfish. The time that we take for ourselves to nourish our spirits, to protect our peace, to elevate ourselves, whether that's in a walk, in a run, in a workout, in a meditation, in a nap. I mean, Lord knows I need the naps sometimes too. Um, that Those moments are ways for us to um, give to ourselves so we can give to the little ones. And I wrote Strong Mama as a love letter to Athena, but also as a way for caregivers to sit alongside the little ones in their lives and show to them as a teachable moment that when we take care of ourselves, we're doing so so we can take better care of you. And then I hope that passes the baton forward so then young folks can start to have their own relationships with these concepts of movement and self-care. Mm -hmm. How important is that tie-in between our physical health and our mental health? Our mind and, mind and body um, is completely interconnected. When we are kinder to ourselves mentally, we make better decisions physically and vice versa. Um, I know I am a better mother, entrepreneur, executive, writer, wife, all of the things. I am better at those things when I have my own workout when I prioritize moments for myself. It is foundational for my household to take that time and for my husband to take his time and then one day for Athena to take her time. And we were really, it's important for us to model that to her. Mm, yeah, I mean, you're so at the tip of the spear of this in terms of modeling that behavior. And I think one of the things as I look back, you know, in my own life is that we didn't learn in school was that how important physical exercise is to not only a sense of confidence, but a sense of well-being, a sense of happiness, determination. We're not taught either as children too about what we feed our bodies feeds our mind and our health and happiness as well. Mm -hmm. our, our capacity for every achievement, big and small, begins with how we're feeling in our own skin. And movement is something that we all have access to. And children are actually innate athletes. They do it naturally when they're playing. And when we speak to them about these concepts of you know, honoring their intuition and using movement as medicine and a way to heal and, and you know, metabolize stress, right? So there's stuff that happens in our lives and we don't have to sit with it. We can move through it. And th this is really important to learn at any age. And honestly, Strong Mama is a message for a lot of adults to take in as well, right? These are new concepts for folks big and small. <laughs> well, that's why it's on the New York Times bestseller list, for sure, because a lot of parents, of course, choose the books. And I always say the best books are the ones that the parents are like, oh, I kind of like this myself. Even though you're really reading it to your child, you're also like, oh, I'm learning something. I feel really good, too. <laughs> Exactly. Well, um, Robin Arzon, what a pleasure to talk to you. Um, so many people, when I said we were doing this, were so excited. They love hearing from you. So excited about your book. And so thank you for sharing Strong Mama with us and sharing your message with us. We appreciate it. Thank you. I look forward to lacing up with you soon. <laughs>